On the third Thursday of every month, pastors and church leaders from near and far gather together for a time of friendship, gospel encouragement, and ministry insights in the warehouse at the Axis Church in downtown Nashville. The following is from one such third Thursday gathering. All right, uh, welcome, glad y'all could be here today. Um, I know there's a lot of places y'all could be, a lot of things you could be doing. Um, so to be here uh, means a lot. I'm thankful for you. We're better with you in the room. Um, very, very thankful um, for y'all to commit uh, to being here. Let's pray and, uh, and we'll get to work this morning. Father, thank you so much for the, the people in this room. Lord, I, I thank you for the families the neighborhoods, the churches that they represent. Lord, I ask that you <clears throat> be with us this morning as we work through the adventures of what it looks like to pastor and shepherd and lead um, ministry lives, particularly pastoral ministry lives, um, <clears throat> would you allow it to be encouraging? Would you protect us from strutting or ego or <clears throat> feeling like we have to justify ourselves with our responses or our words? Lord, just let us be authentic, be real and raw and encourage us as we do this and guide us and heal us. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> um, so I, I read a book uh, this, this summer. I'm, on, um, I'm in the middle of a sabbatical, um, which is such a gift. And uh, part of it has been reading through a book. And <clears throat> I want to read, read this because this is really... I don't know how it, it relates to where we're going this morning, um, but in my heart, it's what got me thinking through what we're going to be processing together this morning, and I'm going to be putting some things together, or putting things uh, before you all, um, and I, I want it to be sort of a discussion because none of these things are things that, I'm, um, that I have a grasp on. They're just affecting me, and they're probably affecting you in some way, and um, so I think we could become better, better together uh, through our discussion this morning. But <clears throat> this is uh, just a, a quick page and a half uh, of chapter two of this book. Um, <clears throat> no man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. The pulpit can be a shop window to display one's talents, but the prayer closet allows no showing off. Poverty-stricken as the church is today in many things, she's most poverty-stricken here in the place of prayer. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. We have many players and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, but few clingers. Lots of pastors, but few wrestlers. Many fears, but few tears. Much fashion and little passion. Many interferers, but few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. And failing here, we fail everywhere. The two prerequisites to successful Christian living are vision and passion, both of which are born in and maintained by prayer. The ministry of preaching is open to few, but the ministry of prayer, which is the highest ministry of all human offices, is open to all. Spiritual adolescents and spiritual babies say, I'm not going to go tonight. It's only the prayer meeting. It may be that Satan has little cause to fear most of our preaching. Yet past experiences sting him to rally all his infernal army to fight against God's people praying. Modern Christians know little of binding and loosing. Though the onus is on us, whatsoever ye shall bind. But have you done any of this lately? God is not prodigal with his power, but to be much for God, we must be much with God. And this world hits the trail for hell with a speed that makes our fastest plane look like a tortoise. Yet, alas, few of us can remember the last time we missed our bed for a night of waiting upon God for world-shaking revival. 
Our compassions are not moved. We mistake the scaffolding for the building. Present day preaching with its pale interpretation of divine truths causes us to mistake action for unction, commotion for creation, and rattles for revivals. The secret of praying is praying in secret. A sinning man will stop praying and a praying man will stop sinning. We're beggared and we're bankrupt, but we're not broken nor even bent. Prayer is profoundly simple and simply profound. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try and is yet, and yet is so sublime and complex that it outranges all speech and it exhausts man's vocabulary. A Niagara of burning words does not mean that God is either impressed or moved. One of the most profound of Old Testament intercessors had no language. Quote, her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. End quote. No linguist here. No voice was heard. There are groanings which cannot be uttered. Are we so substandard to, the New, to New Testament Christianity that we know not the historical robust faith of our fathers, but only the fickle hysterical faith of our fellows? Prayer is to the believer what capital and money is to the businessman. Can any deny that in the modern church organization today, the main cause of anxiety is money? Yet that which tries the modern churches the most today trouble the New Testament church the very least. Our accent is on paying, yet theirs was on praying. When we've paid, the place is taken, but when they prayed, the place was shaken. In the matter of New Testament, spirit-inspired, hell-shaking, world-breaking prayer never has so much been left by so many to so few. For this kind of prayer, there's no substitute. We do it or we die. That's chapter two of a man who passed in 1994. Um, I'm reading several of his books on prayer. Um, Leonard Ravenhill, A.W. Tozer wrote the foreword. It's called Why Revival Tarries, an urgent call <clears throat> for revival. Um, so this morning, uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing is uh, great difficulties in church planting or junior high breakups, ghosting, and your calling. Junior high breakups, um, if you ever experienced one of those growing up, um, you know, it's where you find out that you've been dumped through somebody else. <laughs> um, that happens in churches. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and ghosting is just where people just are off the, the radar. You know, it's like, where? You know. Because um, there's lots of disappointment in church planting. Um, there's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of fear. If we're not careful, there's a lot of frustration. And there's a lot of angst. So I want to talk through some tensions that are prevalent in pastoral ministry, whether it be church planning or, or pastoral ministry, just tensions. And by tensions, I mean challenges, like places where if gone unchecked and unprocessed, no strategy, no soul care applied to them, they'll cause you to burn up and they'll cause you to burn out. And I've been pastoring now for 23 years, and the first 16 years, the, the stuff that we're going to be discussing this morning was, ap was not applicable to, to me because I was different. Like, I felt like none of it mattered uh, because I was a different sort of person. I was a different pastor than those who were experiencing these challenges and these tensions. Yet over the last seven years, been here at the Axis for 10 years, the last seven years I've realized that these challenges and these tensions have less to do with the pastor and more to do with ministry, just ministry in general. Um, the Face app is going around, right? Like wildfire the last 36 hours, right? Um, and so consider a face app on your church and on your ministry. Like this, this will be you. If you stick with this long enough, these challenges won't be theory. Uh, these will become your life. Um, and so, <clears throat> I don't know, there's might probably four or five that we're gonna work through. Um, the first one, uh, and we can discuss this. I want to discuss it, but I also want to get through all these. Uh, so let's not stay too long on any given one. Um, want to respect our time. 
But the first one is the challenge of sermon prep or the tension of sermon prep. So I want you to imagine um, if you went to university, if you went to a college, um, you know what finals, midterms and finals are like. Um, It's where you start taking college life seriously. Um, And you stay up all night and you cram and you cram. Well, let's say that you've got a couple friends that have been wanting to come see you and hang out on campus with you who aren't college students and they just, they just want to have a good time. They want to soak up what college life is like that you've been talking about all year, right? And they're finally here, but it's finals week. And there's that tension of, man, I've got this exam. I've got these three exams I've got to study for. I'm not ready. But your friends are there, two or three, and they're sleeping. They're crashing in your dorm. They want to stay up late. They want to go talk to girls. They want to go play ball. And you don't want to just totally dip out and be cold to them. You want to try to hang with them, but there's also that weight, that pressure of the exam. And so in my mind, uh, that's as close to the analogy of what it looks like to, to prepare a sermon week in and week out. It's like you want to spend time with the people of your church. They deserve your time. They have to have your time. You've got to be available. Yet at the same time, there's this burden, this weight of this exam that you're preparing for, this presentation, this sermon that is going to affect perhaps hundreds of people in just a few days, but you have to totally put that on pause many times and spend that with people. And a lot of times you're your, your friends and the people of your church, they don't understand that burden. Uh, they feel like that they're the only ones that have your ear, that you have to be available to them. They understand you can't be with everybody, but you got to be with, with them. They, they need you right now. And there's that tension of how to be available, when to be available, what time you need to spend with sermon, what time you need to spend shepherding. And both are pastoring. You know, you pastor through your sermon, but you also pastor through pastoral counseling and grabbing coffee with somebody. But that's a weight. That's a tension. And and if we don't get a good handle on this, we're going to under-shepherd and over-prepare, or we'll under-prepare and over-shepherd. And so for those who who develop sermons and write sermons week after week, perhaps more than 40 a year— how do you handle this tension? And is this foreign to you or do you, do you feel this? Those who are in the room that qualifies for this, speak up to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sermon prep definitely is impacted by if you have children and their ages. Um, and regardless of the age of your child until they're gone out of your house, um, I see it as a trimester. It's like your year's broken into spring, summer, and fall. And each one requires a different rhythm, right? A different set of adjustments to calibrate. And it's, what's frustrating is as soon as you feel like you've got it dialed in, a new trimester will come in and throw everything off. You know, no baseball, now baseball, or now basketball, or now vacation. And it's like your, your rhythm gets thrown. Um, <clears throat> We want balance. We want cruise control setting. And honestly, it's, it's a week by week based on needs of the family, appointments, people, pastoring. And great frustration for me comes from when I try to dial it in always this way and forcing myself to write at certain times when it's just not, not there. Because like for me, like 10 to 2 is like prime. You know, it's like when I'm just I'm feeling good or really, really early, you know, like between... During the day, not at evening, no. <laughs> 10 to 2, I'm, I'm in bed. I try to fall asleep during News Channel 5 at 10 o'clock. Um, I try to go to bed, yeah, at or before 10. That's good. <clears throat> and that's the tension of sermon prep. The next um, shifting gears here is the tension of being misunderstood. Um, that happens in pastoral ministry. <laughs> it's real. Um, for instance, I've been told... Um, that I scream at people from the stage, um, that I'm unclear on particular issues that uh, I've never been unclear on, um, and that people can't trust me, and I'm left wondering why. Um, When I go to sleep at night, uh, I do so knowing that not everybody trusts me, uh, knowing that not everyone likes me. I go to sleep every night, wishing that I could do things differently uh, to make everybody happy. But also, I lay down at night believing that God is pleased with my decisions and the way that we're leading the church 
And so this is a great comfort. Uh, but you've got to be willing to love others as you're being misunderstood. You've got to be willing to continue to bear with others as there's other false narratives being spread. Yes, you want to do things perfectly. Yes, you, you don't want to ever hurt or harm anyone. Yeah, you want everyone to be able to trust you. But at the end of the day, for most pastors, you are your greatest critic. You're the one that's hardest on yourself than anyone will ever be. You're the one that wants yourself to change more than anyone else in your church wants you to change. But you've got to trust the Lord. You've got to believe the gospel in order to not hate yourself and in order to not hate other people. And you're going to want to justify yourself. And you'll experience pastoral PTSD where when someone wants to meet with you, you know it's going to be something terrible. And the longer you're in ministry, the more that that's true the more that it's true. Because rarely do they want to check up on you just because they want to love you. Rarely do they want coffee because they just want to be with you. But the gospel can redeem these fears. The gospel can redeem these feelings. And never forget that you will one day stand before God and you will bear the responsibility of the privilege, the power, and the position that you've held over God's people. Never forget that. You will be misunderstood. But don't place your heart in being misunderstood or being understood perfectly. Place your heart and your hope in the gospel, and it'll free you to continue pastoring regardless of being perfectly understood or not by your people. But there's a tension that's constantly there with being misunderstood. There's also the tension of completion that I feel in pastoral ministry. Um, there's no submit, I'm finished. There's no job well done. There's no completed task. Now you can move on when it comes to pastoral ministry. It's continual. Uh, the closest thing that I've discovered over the years that is uh, some closure or some completion with pastoral ministry is a funeral. And most funerals are very heavy. Most of them are laced with sadness. Um, but being able to bury a saint of God is the closest thing to feeling like my job is finished with this one particular person. And so my best day is a funeral. My, be my best day as a pastor is a funeral. This is why I like cutting grass. I call it Mower Monday. After exhausting Sunday, just give me a lawnmower. Give me, I love weed eating. Gosh, I love it. I don't care if it takes chunks out of my leg. I love it because I can turn around and say, it's done. That's why I love planting flowers. It's why I love uh, doing electrical work because I can go, I can do a job, it can work, and I can leave. It's finished. Those things never happen in pastoral ministry except at a funeral. And so there's this tension of completion where you must, I encourage you, uh, to, to find areas where you can experience the joy of completing a task. It is key for your sustainability, regardless of what it is. I don't care if it's washing a car. I don't care if it's helping out some buddies in your church that do construction and lending them a hand every now and then to see a product finished, knowing that you helped do this. Because in reality, you are completing work, but it just doesn't feel that way when you're in the ministry. And so that tension of completion is so heavy and if you don't process it and you, if you don't try to do something with it in, in this way or in similar ways, um, it's, you're, I think you're missing out on some, some joy that could be there. Uh, maybe it's a hobby or some, something. Um, and then another tension that's all too prevalent, I'm having to move a little quicker here. We'll discuss things at the end um, just for time's sake. But the, the tension of people leaving. Um, if you've pastored a week, you've had people leave your church. Um, but whether it be for a job transfer, uh, whether it be people moving to exploring a new city and living in a new city, um, or when people leave to find another church that's better for them, regardless of, of the reason why they're no longer with you at your church, regardless, it hurts. And I'm, I'm left asking myself, what am I doing wrong? Uh, why, why don't people like me? 
how can I change? And then I wonder if commitment to, to churches has always been this fickle, or if this is just sort of a millennial trend. I wonder, like, is what I'm doing even making a difference? And then you get to a place where it's like, why continue loving and pastoring the ones that are with you when all they're going to do is end up leaving? And then how do I explain this to my wife? How do I explain this to my kids, right? Why is so-and-so not here anymore, Daddy? Well, I don't really know, but it's probably because your daddy didn't do enough. He failed them in some way. He didn't say the right thing at the right time. He wasn't available enough, so they're not here because of your daddy. That's why. Now, I'm not saying that's true, but that's what we believe. And in some ways, there is a lot of truth to that, and that's the pressure and the tension of being a pastor in the local church. Part of this is because we live in such a consumeristic society and, and we're used to having things at our doorstep in 24 hours that we order. We're, we're, we live in a microwave society. There's no slow roasting. That's why pressure cookers are selling like crazy during Amazon's two-day sale. It's one of the most popular items. So there's the tension of people leaving. In the midst of this, there's also the tension of wanting just one faithful friend. The pleasure of having one friend who's with you through it all. So for me, last year, um, we put our dog down that we had for like nine years. And that was really hard for me. Like I cried for days. And like, it's really hard to talk about this right now because of how much I miss my dog. And it's a dog. My wife tries to be a really, really close friend to me. She tries to be this person. And it's, it's wonderful. <clears throat> but the thing about my dog is my dog would just obviously listen. I could demand obedience. <laughs> um, I was always enough for him. I was always enough. Just me. Hey, careful. Tread lightly over there. <laughs> um, I remember uh, Pastor Ray at, at Emmanuel. Um, Janny was bringing him certain things that, that people have talked to her about to get to Ray. And, um, and Ray looked back to Janny and said, I just want one person to be for me. I want one person to love me and not constantly be bringing things up for me to help improve. Could you be that person? This was years years in the past when they were just getting started in ministry. But then from then on, Jenny was no longer the go-between for others to get to Ray. And so that, that has influenced Jill and, and how she handles me. But having, having that one faithful friend, the pleasure of having a faithful friend is going to continue to grow. That desire is going to continue to grow in you the longer that you pastor because you're going to have to say bye, thank you, see you later, praying for you to people that continue to leave you and your church. The tension of a given week, a tension of an average week, um, and this came from Chris Griggs. You might have seen it on Twitter. This was back in April. Um, he, he wrote this, a day or two in the life of many pastors I know. Hello? Yeah, hello, pastor. I just wanted you to know that nobody has, has cared for us. Well, a little, but not like what we expected, and so we're not going to be back. Hangs up the phone discouraged. An hour later. Hello? Hello, Pastor. Just wanted to call to say that we've been so blessed by the way the church has loved and cared for us during this crisis. Thank you for everything. 
hangs up the phone grateful. Later that afternoon, hello? Hey, pastor, listen, some folks are really struggling with what happened at the last business meeting. They didn't feel like they have a voice in the decision and they're a bit upset. I just thought you should know. Hangs up the phone, fearful. That evening, Hey, good to see you. Good to see you too, Pastor. Listen, I want you to know that we're thankful for your leadership. We support you. We support the other leaders. Let me know if there's anything that we can ever do to help with anything. Walks away encouraged. The next morning, gets up and checks the email. Hey, I was hoping to meet up, but everyone's busy. Anyway, we're going to start visiting other churches, just looking for something different. Hangs his head and lets out a deep sigh. Later in the day, opens up a card that came in the mail. Pastor, thank you for preaching the word each week. My family's grown so much in the Lord, and we appreciate your hard work to so carefully teach us the Bible. Puts the card in his Bible to read often. That evening at 10.20 p.m., hey, Pastor, Mom isn't doing well. The hospice nurse says it won't be much longer. Okay, I'll be right over. Gets out of bed and gets dressed. Next morning... 8.45, he wakes up after returning home at 5.30 that morning and listens to a voicemail. Pastor, I came by to see you at the office again. Where are you? I need to talk to somebody. No one ever is around. Call me. Hangs up the phone, exhausted. Saturday morning, sits at his kitchen table working on the sermon (laughs) that he's tried to finish all week to have submitted by Thursday. Saturday evening around 10.30 p.m., he kisses his wife goodnight, makes his way back to the kitchen table to finish up his sermon, and he falls asleep preparing. Sunday morning, he gathers with the saints to worship Jesus, enjoy the fellowship of believers, and preach about the grace and comfort that only Jesus Christ can give. He falls asleep after lunch in his recliner, thankful for the call to be an under-shepherd of Christ's flock. Monday morning, he walks out with his eyes lifted up to heaven, the best of books in his hand, the law of truth written upon his lips, the world behind his back, ready to plead with men and women. And yes, there was a crown of gold hanging over his head that was taken from Pilgrim's Progress. This is a bit of what it looks like to have tension pastoral ministry. Now, here's where the calling comes into play with all this heaviness. And I think it's really important for pastors and church planners to talk through this stuff, to talk through this ten- these tensions. And there's, there's hundreds more. These are just the ones that have been heavy on my radar for the last 10 years. <laughs> and they're real. And if you don't deal with them, if you don't process them, if you don't apply the gospel to them and ask others for encouragement through these things, they will overwhelm you, they will burn you out, they will spit you to the ground. This is what this gathering each month is in hopes to try to address some of these tensions that we carry to give us a place where we can process and feel and know what to think and know what to believe and know what to practice. This is where the calling comes in. And I wrote this. I said, I do what I do not because I want a desk job or because it's an easy easy way to make money. I can do electrical work. I've become a general contractor. I can start other businesses and make more money. I don't pastor because it's easy. It's not easy. I don't pastor because for a second I think I'm good at it. I don't pastor because I enjoy talking in front of others. I'm an introvert who's terrified every time I get up in front of anyone. I don't pastor because it makes me somewhat popular. The ridicule I receive isn't worth that exchange. I don't pastor because I want to tell people what to do. I pastor because at age five, God God put it on my heart to do so. And I've never had to consider a career change. It's never been an option for me. I pastor because God's called me to pastor, and by faith, I do it. I pastor because whether I want to or not, it's what I must do. Whether I like it or not, it's what I must do. I can't do anything else because God hasn't put that anything else on my heart yet. So as people come and people go, as people gather and as people scatter, as I make friends and friends turn on me and break my heart, I will by faith continue onward in the work God has me doing. 
I'll do this because I trust him and I believe him. I'll do this because God's called me into pastoral ministry to love people and to equip them and to send them out on mission, making the real Jesus famous in our city and around the world. Though the way is rough and the companions are often few, my God is faithful and he supplies exactly what we need exactly when we need it. Even angels who come and revive us when we are depressed, when we're weary, when we're weak, when we're tired, when we feel like quitting. The Holy Spirit of God is my friend. He's my comforter. He speaks truth to my heart when I feel like leaving, running, and quitting. And when I'm lonely and I, and I simply just want one friend to stick it out with me to the end, I hear God say, you got it. I'm right here with you, and I'm sticking closer to you than any brother. So this applied to the tensions, this confidence in the calling that God has on a man's life. This is what it looks like to pastor, and it's wonderful. It's an adventure. It's layered. But if you're not called, you simply won't last. And if you don't process these truths, you will not last with joy and happiness. You won't do it. You'll, you'll be bitter. You'll be cynical. You'll be cold. You'll, you'll be resolved to pointing to systems instead of shepherding. You'll want to classify everybody into categories instead of learning how to individually offer care with precision because you love them. This is what it looks like to pastor. And this morning... We read through, you know, we're reading through the Bible together as a church, and this morning's reading from Acts 20, I got a sense that Paul felt a little bit about what this felt like, and it jumped off the page because I was thinking about this this morning too, but in Acts 20, it says this. Think about what we just have talked about the last 30 minutes, and, and think about this. <clears throat> this is when he's addressing the elders that were in Ephesus. In verse 17 of Acts 20, so he sends to Ephesus and calls the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to the Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Like he's been faithful, he's been obedient, he's been a strong pastor and shepherd. And now behold, I'm going to go to Jerusalem constrained by the spirit. That's that, that's that calling, right? Constrained by the spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there? Not knowing what's going to happen in your church, faithfully pressing forward in your call. But I do know that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. These tensions, these challenges were before Paul. These tensions and challenges are before you. It's, of course, it looks different. You're not going to be thrown in jail probably this week, but your soul will feel like it's imprisoned. But I do not count my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. So he was an instrument and a tool of God. He wasn't looking for what's his. So in the midst of this tension, be careful of trying to get what you think you deserve. It's not something Paul was looking for. I do not count my life has any value, nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish my course of what God's called me to and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus. And it's this, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that, that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. You're going to leave. I'm going to leave. <laughs> Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of you all. He sees himself as being faithful. I did not shrink from declaring you the whole counsel of God. So he sees something there in the last two verses. He says that I have been called to preach the gospel of God's grace and to give you the, the whole counsel of God. So in the midst of all this tension, you're not fighting personal battles. You're not the, the, the person that's wanting to meet with you is not the enemy, right? 
You're there to speak truth and you're there to receive truth. You're there to give grace and receive grace, to preach this truth and have the word enlighten this friendship, this relationship, this church, this dynamic. You're not there to try to win a personal battle or vendetta. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. And I want you to remember that for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish each of you with tears even. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. I wasn't in it for what I could get out of it. And again, if you're called, it's easier to say that. If you're not called, you're in it for pretty much what you can get out of it. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to, that, you, that these hands ministered to my necessities and those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. Don't cast them aside and grow frustrated. Help the weak. And let's remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. See, there's certain tensions even that Paul experience there that he was sharing with those elders. So we've got 10 minutes. If you've pastored a while, or if you haven't, I don't guess, it's, it doesn't matter, but just what, what sticks out from these tensions? What, I guess, just testify in some ways to these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> and that's, that's, you know, sort of another tension that's at play is um, I always want to learn. I, you know, I always want to learn. Right. I want to learn from good, bad, ugly. Like, it doesn't matter how angry or hostile someone is. Like, I want to, like, swing away, yeah. you know, because you don't even know half of it anyway. <laughs> um, but, like, I, I want to grow from this. But then the other side of the tension is don't, don't receive, I read a quote, this week's like don't I think it was Denzel Washington maybe, um, yeah you can't argue with Denzel right, uh, uh, and I don't agree with it fully, but again it's because it's the other side of receiving it from anybody is he says um, only receive um, criticism from those that you would seek advice from. Um, but I don't think that's healthy to only do that because I always want to learn. You know, because hurt people can teach you a lot, um, and they're often a lot more honest. But, um, but having that, that tension, but you don't want to discount them, be like, well, they're just this, they're just that, so I'm not going to, you'll become narcissistic really quick. But learning to, you know, receive what is helpful uh, and trust the Lord with all the rest and then probably take more that's helpful, that you don't realize is helpful, that your defense attorney is dismissing, um, but if you're not careful, you'll walk away with too much on your shoulders. Um, and then you become something that's, that's not sustainable because you're trying not just to be obedient to your call and embracing how God has crafted you in a certain way for a specific purpose and a time. And you'll become more vanilla. You'll become more, you know, trying to be all things to all people in a different sense than what Paul said. Uh, and that's just not sustainable. Yeah. Um, Aaron, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, you've been doing this a long time. You were prob you're probably one of the, um, you've probably been pastoring in, Nash in the Nashville area longer than anybody in this room. Um, first, thank you for your faithfulness. And I, I deeply value as a pastor and as a friend. Um, I would love if you would pray for us um, and 
And just in light of this and so much more that you might have been feeling in your heart, um, just to even prophetically just pray, pray over us and for us, our churches, our families, Middle Tennessee, um, wherever they might be scattering, Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, with Deport. Um, if you don't mind, I would love that. We pray to thee, our God.